Good morning, Grant Memorial. That was a really impressive uh, costume change, wasn't it? Uh, I figured you didn't want to see those pants uh, all morning long. So anyways, good morning, uh, Grant Memorial. It is good to be with you this morning as we worship the Lord together, as we dig into his word, asking him to encourage us, to challenge us, and change us through it. So I invite you uh, to turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to our text for this morning, starting at 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. We're going to be reading from 417 through to 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 5. Here's what it says. 1 John 4, 17. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that today you would teach us, that you would challenge us and equip us to love through it. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we did uh, last week, we find ourselves again working through this all-important theme of love. On this first week of Advent, when we celebrate the love that Christ showed when he came to earth as Emmanuel to meet us where we are and to save us for eternity. Now, last week, uh, our text taught us that God is love, which, which means, as we unpacked last week, that he is the source of love itself that he is the ultimate example or picture of love, that he is the motivation for us to love others, and that he is the power or the current that enables us to love others. Love, or at least God's agape love, selfless, others-focused, unconditional, which we've been discussing specifically, is not something that we bear down and try our best to conjure up on our own, but is rather something that flows through us from the source in the same way that a light switch simply allows the current to pass through onto its next object. And so the only way that we are enabled to love is by ensuring that we are receiving love from God, connecting ourselves to the source itself so that it may flow through us. That was the big point of the previous number of verses. But the discussion continues. And this week, we find ourselves answering the question, what or whom are the objects of this love that we receive and extend outward? And our text outlines three objects that we have been called to love. And it provides a qualifier for each, unpacking just what it looks like to love each of these objects. And these objects are the world, the church, and God. Right? These are the objects of our love, the world, the church, and God. Now, before we begin, I, I do think it's important to point out that, that even though this particular text presents them in this order, world, church, God, this list is actually uh, in reverse order of importance, right? Number three, loving God, is absolutely primary. 
And, and we see that throughout all of Scripture. Loving the church, or more explicitly, our brothers and sisters in Christ, is secondary. And we'll get to that a little bit later on. And love for the world, for those we see around us, while essential, is seen as third in importance, at least according to John and his community. With the reason being that if we do not love God and we do not love each other well, we have nothing to draw the world into that is of any value, right? We need to get things right at home before we invite people over. Now, that doesn't mean that loving the world is of any less value, but loving God and the church first creates the environment through which we can love our world the best. Okay, so let's explore, as the text does, in reverse order of importance, the objects of the agape love we receive from God and extend out of ourselves. So first, we are called to love the world. Right? We're called to love the world. Listen to verse 17. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Did you catch that last part? In this world, we are like Jesus. Right? If, if the proof of God in us is agape love, as we learned last week, we can be confident then of our connection to him when he lives out his love through us in the world. As we are like Jesus, our text says. But what does it look like to live like Christ? Well, remember, as we discussed last week, the normative definition of what agape love is, according to the Bible, is Jesus' self-sacrifice on the cross. And so our calling in this world and to this world is to ourselves be others-focused, selfless people who give to and serve others, even at our own expense or at the expense of our own comfort, and even when it seems uncalled for or undeserved. Now, the next verse gives us a really interesting qualifier of what it looks like to live out this kind of love practically. Look at verse 18. It says this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Now, this is something that I personally did not connect until this week. That agape love from the Christian community towards the world ought to be fearless, right? The way that we love the world is to love fearlessly. Church, we cannot withhold love out of fear that our love will not be returned. We cannot withhold love out of fear of what others will think about us. We cannot withhold love out of fear of how it will impact our comfort or how it will change our lives. We love because it is what we do. Church, agape love doesn't weigh the options. Agape love does what is right. And this church is convicting for me because if I'm honest with myself, I, I regularly weigh the options when it comes to loving, right? I regularly let fear get in the way of doing the loving thing. So there are times when I don't extend generosity because I'm afraid of myself not having enough if I give what I have away. Or I struggle to extend grace or forgiveness or second chances because I'm afraid of what might happen if I do or if I'll just enable that person. Or, or I don't immediately follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit because I'm afraid of, of, of where I will be led, how my life will be turned upside down. Right? And I think this is something that we all do. We weigh the options when we consider loving others. When we're presented with opportunities to love others, we kind of come up with a pro and con list. We put fences around the love that we share, and so what we end up doing is loving others to an extent, but not to its fullness. 
Now, I'm sure we can all fill in the blank of how fear rears its head in all of our lives, restricting our love. But church, agape love for the world in the way of Jesus has no restrictions. It doesn't weigh the options or fear the implications. True love is the antithesis of fear. Or as our text says it, love drives out fear. True agape love wins when it's in conflict with fear. And nowhere in scripture is this more evident than when Jesus himself was on his way to die on the cross. We read in Matthew 26, starting at verse 36. Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet Not as I will, but as you will. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. The text says that he went away a third time and prayed. And while we don't know exactly what words he prayed, we do know that within 24 hours, he had willingly laid down his life on the cross carrying out the greatest act of agape love the world has ever seen. Jesus himself, as a human, experienced fear. Fear of death, of pain, of the unknown. And yet the fear was not nearly as great as the love that extinguished it. And for those of us who have received this kind of agape love from God should let fear be driven out before our very eyes as we enact the fearless love God channels through us. We are called to love the world and we are called to do it fearlessly. The next object of our love that we read about in our text is love for the church. Right? Love for the church, or more precisely, translated, the brethren. Our brothers and sisters in Christ. The others who have themselves received a God's agape love. Now, it's important here to mention that this is, is not just a generic audience that the letter is inviting uh, us to love. It's specifically calling for love within the body of Christ. In fact, whenever 1 John mentions the Christian calling to love, it's referring to love for the brethren. Aside from the previous point that we just talked about, about living like Jesus, which implies loving the world, every single explicit directive to love others in this letter is referring not to others in general, but to the brothers and sisters, to those within the church. Let's take a quick survey or a quick inventory of what we've read in 1 John so far in this series. 1 John 2.10 says, Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light. 1 John 3.10, Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love who? Their brother and sister. 1 John 3.11, For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love who? One another, the brethren. 1 John 3.16, This is how we know what love is. Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for who? Our brothers and sisters. 1 John 3.17, If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? 1 John 3.23, And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one one another, the brethren, as he has commanded us. First John 4, 7. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. First John 4, 11 to 12. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another, the brethren. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Right? There we have it. And that list is not even exhaustive. 
What John and the elders are referring to exclusively when they speak of extending love is love within the church, love among the branches who are attached to Christ the vine. And here they double down on this idea. Starting in verse 20, the text makes it clear. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they've seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Love the brethren. Right? This couldn't be stated any more clearly. The object of this love are the brothers and sisters. And it certainly doesn't pull any punches saying that you cannot love God and hate his children. Right? You cannot love God and hate his children. Think about that. If you came to me and said, Cam, I really like you, but I hate your kids, we would not be cool, right? Like, th things would not be good between us. Or if you acted viciously towards my family, slandering them, attacking them, and you assumed I was okay with it, you would be sorely wrong. And God is no different in regards to those he loves. You cannot love God and hate his family. Right? You can't love God and hate his children who he loves and laid his life down for, as we read in Ephesians 5.25. Now, I may be wasting my breath here right now because these people likely are not tuning in, but there's a movement among many who call themselves Christians to declare that they love God, but, but they can't stand the church, right? I love God, but I hate the church. They, they can have a relationship with God, but they don't need one with his people. But church, that's impossible, Right? This is no more possible than an arm saying that it's fine on its own, having no relationship with the other parts of the body it's attached to. Paul the Apostle says exactly this point. In 1 Corinthians 12, he writes, The body is a unit, though it's composed of many parts, and although its parts are many, they all form one body. And then he says it, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. For, if the, body does not cons for the body does not consist of one part, but of many. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Nor can the head say to the feet, I do not need you. And then he goes on to say, there should be no division in the body, but its members should have mutual concern for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. If you are attached to the vine, if you are in relationship with Christ, you are attached to the other branches as well. And their health is your health. And their trial is your trial. Now that is not to say that we need to love everything that every Christian does. Or that everything that's done in the name of the church is actually of God. But if our reaction to that which we don't like or agree with is to hate those who Christ calls his own. Our text says that the love of God is not in us. We cannot love God and not love whom he loves and gave his life to save. Now, as a point of clarification, some may be wondering, why not? Right? Like, why is it that I can't love, I can't love God and, and not love another person? Right? It seems reasonable that I could love one object and not another. Why is it so difficult that, to see that someone could love God and not a brother or sister? Well, there's a lot to say about that, actually, but in its simplest form, the answer is that loving God and loving his children are one and the same, right? One of the primary ways that we love God is by loving his children. These two concepts cannot be separated. Uh, let me give you an illustration. 
When uh, Bethany, and, Bethany and I moved to, to BC, where we served at a church there, uh, the congregants found out pretty early that I had played a lot of hockey growing up. And as a result, one of the young men at the church pursued a relationship with me based on our shared love of hockey and the fact that he was a hockey player too. And so over a period of a year or so, he shared all of his hockey exploits with me, his latest stats, the results of his hockey games, and according to his reports, he was a very good hockey player. Well, fast forward about a year, and I decided to bring our youth group uh, to a public skating event. So the whole crew of us, this young man included, who served as a youth leader, went down to the rink, did up our skates, and headed out on the ice. And what came as a shock to me as I started my first few laps was that this uh, fellow hockey player did not know how to skate, right? He was stumbling around, tripping over his feet and holding onto the boards when they were available. Well, to make a long story a little less long, what I found out that day was that all along, when he had been talking about hockey, he was actually referring to ball hockey or floor hockey, Played in a gymnasium on shoes, not skates. Now, I don't want to offend the ball hockey players out there, but ball hockey is not hockey hockey, right? A prerequisite to play hockey, the sport, is the ability to skate, right? If you play a game that doesn't involve skating, you're doing something else, right? It may be a lot of fun, but it's not really hockey, now, the reason I share this story is that the love of God is the same. If, if you are not loving others, if you're not loving the brethren, you may be doing something else, but you are not loving God. Because an essential part of loving God, one of the defining features of loving God is loving what he loves, loving his children. As, as skating is essential to hockey, loving your brothers and sisters in Christ is essential to loving God. If you are a hockey player, it goes without saying that you can skate. And if you love God, it goes without saying that you love your brothers and sisters. Simply, you can't play hockey if you can't skate. And you can't love God if you don't love his children. Jesus himself makes this very clear throughout his teaching that loving others is how we go about loving God. In Matthew 25, 40, Jesus taught this, saying, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. When we love others, we are loving God. That's what Jesus teaches. It's also why when Jesus was asked what the most important commandment was, he didn't just answer one thing, he gave two answers. Matthew 22, 36 to 40, he's asked, Teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Did you notice that Jesus wasn't asked what the two greatest commandments were? But he answered two, because these two go together. They are part and parcel, right? Love God with all you are and have, and the way that you do this, or the practical, physical way, is by living out love towards others, toward the body of Christ, which is why our First John text points out the invisibility of God in verse 20. God is not seen, it says, but our brothers and sisters are. So our opportunity to show love to God practically is to love those he has put around us, those whom he resides in. When we love one another, we are loving God. Now church, we need to understand that this is not just theoretical, this is an essential calling in our lives to love the other branches on the vine, whether they're close to you, cramping your style, or they're on the other side of the vine and you don't have much in common. And the qualifier here in the text of how we love our brethren is that we acknowledge who they are and label them as such. Look at verse 20 again. 
For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen, God can, cannot love God whom they have not seen. Right? The first step in loving the brethren is knowing who the brethren are and seeing them as brethren. We love the church as family. Right? We love the church as family. I think often our fatal flaw when it comes to loving those within the church is that we see those who don't agree with us or see eye to eye with us as enemies or obstacles, not as family or siblings. Right? And that could be the church down the road that we bicker about secondary issues with. Or it could be the person in the next aisle who we try to avoid at all costs. Chapter 5, verse 1 tells us, as we've heard all through this book, that everyone who believes that Jesus Christ is born of God. Right? That is the entrance requirement into the family of God. Which means that, that they, whoever comes to your mind right now, are family. And it means that God so loves them that he gave up his life to save them in the same way that he gave up his life to save you. Grant Memorial, we are family. And that means something about how we treat each other, even in, well, especially in conflict and disagreement. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. My family does not always see eye to eye. Maybe our fatal flaw is that we're all stubborn and we're all always right. But, but my wife and I don't see eye to eye on everything. And my kids don't like every decision that we make as parents. But not agreeing with each other does not mean that they now become my enemy. My, obje my obstacle to overcome or my enemy to defeat Right, That they now become the target of my abuse or that they're fair game to slander and attack or gossip behind their backs. No, we are called to be one. And so we reconcile our differences in love because we're family first. We are on the same team. And it's the same way with the family of Christ. We are on the same team. And this is of great importance. In fact, it, it's Christ's greatest desire for the church that we would be one, that we would be unified, that we would be united. Now to back this claim up, as we have so many times throughout the series, I want us to jump quickly to the Gospel of John, to chapter 17, to that same high priestly prayer of Jesus that we read a couple of weeks ago. Now, there's a section of Jesus' prayer where he prays for us, all of those who will believe in him and represent him in the world. And do you know what he prays for? Unity. He prays for unity. The, the one time Jesus prays for his future followers, for the church, he prays for unity. Take a listen. My prayer is not for my disciples alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Right? Jesus' prayer for the church, for God's children, is that we would be unified. That, that we would share in agape love as the Father and Son share in agape love. Now did you notice the why? Why? Why he prays this? Verse 23 said, So that the world will know that you sent me. Right? Our unity, according to Jesus, can confirm or bring into question the reality of Christ's salvation in the minds of the world. 
right? A unified church is a sign and powerful witness to the reality of the love of God. But a church that is not unified can force people to call into question a love that they do not see carried out. Church, if we are sent on mission into the world, as we read a couple weeks ago in John 17's prayer, we do not have the time to waste fighting amongst ourselves. As we read in Ephesians 6, 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Grant Memorial, our battle is not against flesh and blood, and it's certainly not against one another. So let's stop acting like it is. If you are a Christian, your battle is not about masks or our church's COVID restrictions. If you are a Christian, your battle is not against the deacon board. If you are a Christian, your battle is not about our youth group activities or our worship styles or about what the church across town is doing. There is a fight for souls of people going on in our city and in our world. And we have been sent together to bring the love and light of Christ against the darkness in the world. That is our fight that we need to engage in. That is the real fight that actually means something beyond our preferences and political opinions. Right? Imagine if in the Second World War, the Allied soldiers spent their time fighting over the uniforms they would wear or complaining about how shiny their boots needed to be or what type of bugle horn they should sound or if the Allied soldiers slandered the other countries they were aligned with, if they fought battles amongst themselves, how ineffective they would be to fight the real battle in front of them. This is the same with us. Church, we need to stop spending our time dwelling on and fighting with one another. We need to be unified on mission to fight the real battle we have been called to. We have a shared enemy, and it's not one another. There are more important things going on of eternal significance. There is a world that desperately needs to know the love of God and to see it modeled by the family of God and to see it spread as the church works together arm in arm to bring agape love to every corner of the world. And this will only happen if we heed the words of 1 John to love one another by seeing each other not as enemies or obstacles, but as family. And the final object of love we see in our text is the most important, although I need to give it the least attention today. Love for God. Love for God. If you've been in church for long, I, I don't need to take time to convince you that God is the ultimate object of our affection. As Deuteronomy 6.5 says, and the rest of Scripture repeats throughout, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Right? Love for God is the ultimate calling for all of humanity. Or as the famous Westminster Catechism puts it, the chief end of man, right? the reason we're here, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever, which is to seek him, to serve him, to be in loving relationship with him. So there's no argument to be made here aside from pointing out the qualification that our text provides for us regarding how we love God. In addition to and completed in large part by the act of loving others, which we've already discussed, we love God, our text says, by obeying his commands. 1 John 5, 3 says, this is love for God to keep his commands, right? Love for God is doing what he says. Obedience is how we enact the love of God, knowing his word and living it out. And this is consistent with what we already read in 1 John 2, 3 to 5, a number of weeks ago. 
says this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. Right? Love for God involves obedience to his word, and that obedience is proof of a relationship with him. Just imagine with me for a second uh, that I brought a dog up here on stage with me. And then I brought up five people up here as well, one of whom was the owner of the dog. How could we figure out who the owner was? Well, it would be the one that the dog was obedient to, right? If all the people started saying things like sit and roll over, shake a paw, the dog, hopefully, would be obedient to its master, right? A good dog obeys the words of its master, and so does a good follower of Christ, or as John says, any follower of Christ. Those who truly know God, those who have a relationship with him, want to do what he says, respond positively to his voice, to his word, to his commands. Now on the flip side, disobedience proves just the opposite. If, if God says something and I say, no thanks, if I'm not obedient to it, I'm actually saying that I don't care what God says. Right? I don't value what it is that God says. So if I read the scriptures and then I turn my back, say no thanks, I'm proving that I'm not in loving relationship with God because I don't care what he says. Right? Church, those who know and love God care what he says. Those who love God are obedient to his word. Now, I know we're short on time, but uh, I want to close by taking just a quick look at verse 3 and 4, which is a great place to wrap up. Verse 3 ends with the assertion that his commands are not burdensome. His commands are not burdensome. You see, well, in our culture, obedience, rules, laws, commands are not seen as that positive. They're not really welcomed. But when they are given by the one who provides the strength to accomplish them, to live them out, they bring joy rather than struggle because we get to participate in the love that changes everything. As Jesus says in Matthew eleven thirty, 30, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, church, it's not easy because it's simple or easy because it's, it's comfortable. It's easy because he is the one who does it. He is the one who enables us to love if we just remain in him and let his love flow through us. And what results, or, or the final promise at the end of verse four, is that everyone who is born of God, the ones attached to the vine, who labor with God, the ones who live this out as God loves through them, overcome the world because the love of Christ overcomes everything which is precisely what we celebrate this time of year lighting candles and singing carols Christmas is the celebration that love has indeed overcome the world that in the small figure, the small frame of a baby boy in first century Judah, agape entered the world so that the darkness could be overcome by the light of his love. And church, we have been given that light. The same love that brought God to earth is available to us so that we may love the world fearlessly, love each other as family, and love God obediently, or in proper order this time, to love God obediently by loving each other as family, so that together we can fearlessly love the world to which we have been sent. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And God, we pray that the calling, Lord, to love 
to love you with everything and to love each other as family and to love the world fearlessly, Lord, that, that, that you would enable us to live this out. It's a high calling. It's a hard calling. But Lord, we thank you and we trust and depend on the fact that you are the one who gives us the strength. Lord, we pray that, that you would help us to draw near to you, to receive your love, that it may ooze out of us towards everyone that you have placed in our worlds. God, we love you. Help us to feel your love, to experience your love, to know your love. And may others feel, experience, and know it as well through the love they receive from us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.